Hey friends, Alvin here. Happy New Year. It is January and we are having our first monthly Zoom. And this month we're going to be looking at mental health. I am pleased to have Emily Mill. Actually, no, Emily Neal now, who is <laughs> our who is our next gen administrative assistant. Uh, but also she just finished her MA in counseling and also works part-time as a therapist. Uh, and so there's a lot of things that, uh, that she's been learning. We would love to learn from her as well. And so Emily, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be chatting about mental health tonight. <laughs> Every time we talk about mental health, um, I always like to remind people that this conversation um, could sometimes be a challenging one. Uh, so if there's ever a moment that feels hard, be sure that you take stock of that and pay attention to the feelings that come up with that. Um, but tonight we we're talking about mental health, youth, and COVID, and how we make sense of both uh, a global pandemic and what's that, what that's doing to, to the mental health of not only ourselves, but also the youth that we work with. Um, so tonight, a few things that we want to go over. As Alvin said, my name is Emily. I work with him at CBOQ. Um, I also finished my MA, Counseling Psychology, in, in the spring and I'm working at a clinic in Waterloo doing individual and couples therapy, both online and in clinic. Um, tonight, I wanna to talk about four things. Uh, first thing, I wanna take a look at some of the current trends in, in mental health research, what some of the statistics are here in Canada, particularly how that pertains to, to youth. Um, I wanna talk about high functioning mental illness, which is kind of a buzzword in the mental illness and mental health community right now. Uh, I wanna look at strategies for crisis and how we deescalate crisis. And then I wanna talk a little bit about self-care, particularly for you as, as youth workers. So let's dive in. Current mental health trends here in Canada. So 70% of people living with mental health see their first symptoms before 18. Mental illness and mental health challenges affect 1.2 million children and youth across Canada, and that number raises to, to 7.5 million by the age uh, of 25. Less than 20% of those people receive the help that they need. Those three statistics were brought to you by Mental Health Commission of Canada. 34% of Ontario high school students indicate a moderate to serious level of psychological distress. This means that they're experiencing um, anxiety and depression on a daily or semi-daily basis. And in 2016, suicide accounted for 19% of deaths among uh, youth ages 10 to 14. So that's our, our junior highs. 29% uh, among youth aged 15 to 19, so our senior highs. And then 23% among young adults aged 20 to 24, so college and careers age group. And First Nations youth die by suicide about five to six times more often than non-Aboriginal youth. And suicide rates for Inuit youth are amongst the highest in the world at 11 times the national average. And those statistics come from the um, CAMH. So knowing some of those statistics and paying attention to how that kind of affects your youth group, I want to talk about something called high functioning mental illness. And I want to preface this by saying that these are not, these are all theoretical indicators. None of these are rooted in clinical evidence. But one of the things that high functioning mental illness uh, shows up as it, is the, the superstar kids in our ministry, the all or nothing volunteers, the, the people that seem to be doing really, really well. And, and sometimes when we take a step and we pause, we realize that there's other stuff going on. So I wanted to talk about high functioning anxiety and high functioning depression. I wanna talk a little bit about how those differ from regular anxiety and depression in a second. High functioning anxiety shows up like people who are overly productive. They're outgoing and people pleasing. They need a lot of reassurance and making sure that they're doing a good job. These people tend to overthink or ruminate, which is a fancy word for just cyclical thinking, a thinking cycle that you can't break out of. They're often mentally exhausted and they have a hard time saying no. I'm sure you can think of a few kids in your ministries that might fall into those categories. High functioning depression, on the other hand, has a lot of the same stuff uh, as regular depression or people who are experiencing a major depressive episode. And some of these things include decreased appetite or overeating, insomnia or oversleeping. 
lack of energy. They're just doing sort of the basic daily living tasks. They have lowered self-esteem, difficulty concentrating or making decisions. Their short-term memory challenges. They feel sad or hopeless a lot of the time. And they're maintaining activities of daily living. This is where it gets a little bit different. So for someone who's experiencing a major depressive episode, those daily living things become really, really challenging. It's hard to get out of bed, to, to get dressed in the morning, to show up to youth group, to give a, give a friend a FaceTime. For high functioning depression, those things come a little bit more easily, but they're not without the other symptoms uh, and signs of depression. So how is it different? We just talked about it a little bit, but mental health uh, is defined as being able to contribute positively to society, to be an active contributor. You're going to work, you're going to school, um, you're getting up and you're doing those daily living things that we just talked about. But just because you're contributing to society in, in a positive or in a healthy way doesn't actually mean you're mentally healthy. So thinking about those symptoms that we just talked about, pay attention to some of the kids or your volunteers in your ministries. So what can we do about it? Uh, I feel like right now, particularly during COVID, we, we struggle to, to figure out how to navigate. Stuff looks so different. Our ministries look different. Our connections with people look different. Um, so here are some encouragements that I hope will help you guys recreate those connections uh, and pay attention to the mental health of your kids. So first and foremost, similar to every suggestion from every person anywhere, make those personal connections, not just in the youth group calls, but in one-on-one -on -one interactions. Set up times where you can shoot that person a text, pay attention to what's going on in their lives. Um, if they have a test coming up, be sure to text them before, say that you're thinking about them, pray for them. Um, and text them afterwards to see how it went. Those little one-on-one -on -one touch points are going to contribute to your relationship with that kid and they'll reach out to you if they're struggling. Secondly, actively pray for your youth's mental health and encourage church members and, and volunteers to do the same. We pray for so much for our youth's lives. We pray for their, their health and their school and their relationships and that they'll come to have a deep and meaningful relationship with Jesus. But Oftentimes we forget to actively and intentionally pray for their mental health, particularly now as virtual school gets extended and online learning has its challenges as we still have this crazy global pandemic with no real concrete end, actively pray for your kids' mental health. Check in on disconnected kids as well. So if you have a kid who has been engaged in ministry. They've been showing up to stuff, they've been actively participating and they disappear, reach out to that kid. If you have a kid that you know might be struggling, reach out to them. And if you can't connect with that kid, reach out to their parents. Again, it's just reinforcement that you are, are someone in their lives that cares deeply about them. Related to that, watch out for the red flags. So red flags come in a lot of different packages, uh, changes in behavior tends to be the most obvious. So like I said in that last point, if a kid has been showing up to youth group events online, they've been coming to Sunday morning services online, and they suddenly don't, uh, that's a really strong indicator that something might be going on. Also, if you have a kid who's normally bubbly and high energy and full of laughs and jokes and smiles and they're muted for a couple times in a row, it's more than just a bad day, reach out to that kid. Another great thing to do is openly discuss mental health. So contributing in conversations like this, talking to your youth about mental health challenges that you've might had or your family might have had, um, experiences that you've had with, with mental illness, uh, openly discuss it. Also making some language switches. Oftentimes, when people are living with mental illness, they get stuck in the pattern of me. And what I mean by that is when they're talking about their mental illness, it becomes my anxiety, my depression, my panic attack. And what that does is it totally connects the idea that your 
identity is now wrapped in your mental illness. And for people in ministry, we want to break that cycle. We want to remind kids and youth and young adults that their identity isn't in their mental illness. Their identity is in Christ. And by separating that language, by shifting to a language of the versus my we create some space in that identity so that we can remind them that Jesus is central to their identity. And their mental illness isn't. So if you're talking with a youth and they're talking about my anxiety is so bad, my panic attack was the worst ever, encourage them to shift that language and say, it's not my anxiety, it's the anxiety. It's the panic attack, it's the depression. Similar to that, when we're having conversations about suicide, Instead of saying this person commit suicide, which has the connotation of criminality, encourage them to say and encourage language with your volunteers and your church members as well to say that that person died by suicide. It takes away the harshness and, and the criminality, as I said, of that suicide and creates a little compassion for the individuals that are dealing with the grief of that death. It also reminds us that suicide is not a criminal act in and of itself, but is often a byproduct of illness. Lastly, know the crisis centers, the hotlines and the counseling services in your area. Have some resources at your church when we can get back to doing stuff in person. Have some tabs or, or some links on your website or in your Facebook group or however you connect with your kids so that they know if they're struggling, they have a place to look for good, trusted information. Next thing I want to talk about is some strategies for crisis. And the first acronym uh, I'd like to share with you tonight is ALGI. This comes from, from mental health first aid, actually. So if you've taken this course, this won't be new information. Um, but this framework is actually really helpful for de-escalating panic attacks, um, talking to kids if they're, if they're contemplating suicide or self-harm. They're really great techniques for allowing someone to open up and you can get that, that conversation started. So the first thing we wanna do whenever we're, we're coming to the situation is always assess the risk of suicide or harm. Um, talk to that person, we'll get to some suicide uh, protocol in a second, uh, but talk to that person, see if they're in danger personally or someone else is in danger. Um, and if they answer yes, then follow up with the suicide protocol that we're gonna talk about in a second. But if they answer no, or if they answer yes, your next step is to listen non-judgmentally. Let that person just share whatever is on their hearts. Um, as youth workers, I know so many of you are so wonderful at this already, but giving a youth a space to just get something off their chest can sometimes be the most helpful thing in the world. After listening, we want to give. Give reassurance and information that you're there for them, that you support them. Thank them for being open and honest with you. Next, you wanna encourage them. Encourage that person to get the appropriate help, which is in our last slide, when we talked about knowing the services uh, that are available in your area, share some of those resources with them. Ask if you want, if they want you to, to book an appointment with a counselor or a therapist or to help them talk to their parents about it if that's something that's challenging. And lastly, you wanna encourage them again, encourage other supports this time. Get them connected back in with friends or with family, create those connections. Um, as youth pastors, you guys are actually one of those other supports and it's amazing, amazing the impact that can have on a kid's life. Next up, uh, we're going to talk about dealing with, with self-harm and with suicide. From our statistics at the beginning, we know that this is a problem that affects junior highs through college and career age students and beyond. So knowing how to de-escalate that is a really, really helpful tool. First thing we want to do is ask directly. Oftentimes people shy away from asking about suicide directly because they think that it's going to plant the idea in someone's head. And I want to reassure you that that is not true. If someone's struggling with suicidal ideation, which is the thoughts of suicide, you talking about it isn't going to further them in that direction. It honestly often has the opposite effect. So let them square in the face and ask them, are you thinking of dying by suicide? If they answer yes, follow up with, do you have a plan? Oftentimes if someone is seriously considering it, the steps are laid out in their head and they know what's going to happen. But by having that conversation, you can divert that, that plan. 
The answer yes to either of those questions, your next step is to activate EMS. And again, this looks a little bit different now that we are in a virtual space majority of the time. But making sure that we're activating EMS as soon as possible to ensure that if anything does happen, there are emergency medical staff on the way to help that person. Next thing you do is stay with that person. Um, continue talking with them. If you're in person, stay with them. If you're online, stay with them. Keep them on the phone. Keep them FaceTiming. Keep them on the Zoom call. Make sure that there isn't any way for them to go, to go and, and, and follow through with that harm. Last thing we wanna do is ensure that they're safe uh, and only leave once someone more qualified arrives. Uh, this could be a parent, this could be a guardian, this could be uh, EMS or police. Make sure that you're with that person and only leave once you feel that they are safe uh, with someone that they trust or someone that can help them. Lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about how your mental health can be enhanced, uh, particularly after however many months and, and days and what feels like years uh, of online ministry and feeling like we're giving so much and not getting tons back. I want to talk a little bit about self-care. Self-care uh, has been a little bit co-opted by the Instagram influencers of the world with the manicures and the bubble baths and the face masks. And I assure you that is a part of self-care. Uh, but what I want to talk about is creating a self-care plan that's daily and intentional and covers these four areas. When I teach about self-care, I ask uh, the people that I'm working with to figure out a, a daily self-care act for each of the categories. We need something physical, something that moves our bodies, something that gets our blood flowing. This could be a walk outside or a workout at home or an epic snowball fight uh, with the people in your family. Next thing, spiritual. I'm sure all of you guys are great at this already, but having a daily spiritual practice, spending time in the word, spending time in prayer or listening to worship music, making sure that we're getting daily time with God. Mentally, this looks like something that challenges your brain. So in the same way we want something that challenges our body is we want something that challenges us cognitively as well. Uh, this could be listening to a podcast or reading a book, doing a crossword podcast, puzzle or a word surge or something that gets that brain going. And lastly, we want something that builds into ourselves emotionally. Uh, my greatest suggestion for this one has always been a gratitude journal, uh, but this could also be having a conversation with a friend that makes you laugh, listening to something that brings you joy, um, finding something in your life or in your home that, that you can just go to, to find a space of happiness, a space of peace, to kind of brush off all the stress that so many, so many of us are living with every day. The key to self-care is that we need to start small with one thing that we can build on every single day so that we can become consistent in that routine. Right now, all of us are being asked to pour out so much of ourselves into our ministries, into our relationships, into anything and everything right now. So Many of us are feeling so stretched. And when it comes to a daily self-care practice, that's how we start filling our cups again. That's how we start being able to have more stuff to pray out and all the wonderful people that we work with in our ministries. That's all I got for you guys. I hope it was helpful. Here are some adorable animals that hopefully uh, bring you some joy after talking about some challenging stuff. And I think uh, Alvin, it's back to you. Well, thank you, Emily, for a lot of things that you shared. Uh, perhaps we might be able to get her presentation on our website later on. Uh, obviously, uh, if you like, you can reach out to Emily. We'll have her email address as well as part of that presentation. So uh, we appreciate all the different ways that she has helped us to, to better understand not just uh, how do we approach mental health with our youth, but also with ourselves. And some key resources that some of you, uh, although you weren't part of the Q&A, uh, we'll throw some of the resources as well into the links. Uh, for next month in February, February 8th is our next one, uh, we will have Joel Gordon, who will be joining us to look at the idea of uh, a theological approach towards racism. And so uh, we'll, we'll hopefully you'll join us on Monday, February the 8th, the day after Blizzard. I don't know who planned that, but that's okay. We'll, uh, we'll see you then at 7 p.m. Blessings to you.